Hello and welcome to our webinar on overcoming mechanical testing challenges for EV battery material development and production. Thank you so much for being here. I'm Nick Erickson, your host for this webinar. Today, I'm joined by Charlie Pryor, a senior applications engineer here at Instron. In this role, Charlie focuses on electronics and EV battery applications. He works uh, with R&D and quality labs to identify and optimize solutions for static testing requirements. <laughs> He's here to discuss mechanical testing for EV batteries, including trends in the industry, common testing challenges for these materials, and how these challenges are being addressed. We expect the presentation should take around 40 minutes. If you do have any questions, please use the Q&A to submit these anytime throughout the presentation. We'll aim to address these at the end. We also have our strategic marketing manager, Phil Levesque, on the webinar behind the scenes to assist with these questions. He works really closely with many of our EV battery customers. So we're happy to have him. I also want to mention that we are recording this webinar and that all of you will receive an email afterwards with a link to the video. And it will also be available on our website, instron.com. So with all that said, I'll turn things over to Charlie to get us started. All right. Thanks, Nick. Hi, everyone. So thank you for the introduction. Just I guess, as Nick just said, so I'm a senior application engineer here at Instron. Uh, I've been at Instron for about five years now. Uh, before that, I worked for a couple of years in the automotive industry. I've always had a passion for automotive stuff. So uh, it's been great that I'd say about the last three years or so, my focus has shifted at Instron to be towards automotive, electronics, and EV battery testing. Uh, so that's kind of where my niche has been at Instron so far. All right, so why are we here? Uh, we're here to talk about, uh, first off, the trends that are affecting materials testing in the battery industry. Um, from there, we'll talk more about some of the challenges that are faced by R&D and quality control labs. Uh, and then we'll end talking a little bit about, you know, how testing data is correlated uh, and collected between labs. Um, I kind of want to start this off with just a very brief story, uh, kind of where this idea came to me uh, for the webinar here. Uh, last year, I went to the International Battery Show, um, and one of the keynote presentations was a panel of many, many well-known, knowledgeable, and experienced leaders in the industry, and they were discussing many of the obstacles and gotchas that they ran into from going from R&D all the way to a full production gigafactory. Um, in, this, uh, in this presentation, I loved hearing about these challenges, um, some of the ways that they overcame them. Um, for instance, like one example that came up that you would, would have never really thought of uh, was something as trivial as like the parking lot situation, right? So, uh, you know, how many parking spots do you need? And if you're doing a shift change, how's that traffic going to look? How many parking spots are you going to need to do a shift change if you're doing, you know, if you're trying to run 24 hours at your gigafactory? Um, just little things like this that might not be thought of. Uh, immediately, right? They might not be at the forefront of someone's thoughts when they're dealing with so many other responsibilities when trying to get a Gigafactory up and running. Uh, and that's what inspired me for this topic. So uh, from product development, to quality control, you know, manufacturers run into many obstacles along the way uh, as they ramp up to, into production. And, you know, I'm, I'm here to share some of those challenges that we've seen uh, and hopefully give some, di some direction on how to overcome some of these challenges so you don't have to do it on your own. So in this webinar, we'll focus on how Instron can give Gigafactories and test labs an advantage. Uh, and this includes more than just fi fixtures and frames, you know, things like software, application support, and service that we're, you know, we're here to provide too. So just a very brief background on Instron. Uh, for those who aren't as familiar, uh, Instron is a materials testing manufacturer, um, a testing machine manufacturer. We've been in business for over 75 years now. Uh, and up until now, you know, we've been partnering with some of the largest global leaders in the automotive and battery industry to help them with their testing. Uh, you know, from this, we've worked with, through, you know, many challenges, many obstacles, uh, and we've been able to learn and provide a lot of support or solutions to these challenges. And that's kind of where I've gained a lot of my experience. And that's kind of where I have, you know, stuff to share with you today. Um, as I go through this presentation, I like to point out, uh, it's never really a one size fits all solution in this industry. Um, there's a lot of things that come up, a lot of new iterations of, you know, different types of tests, different types of material, a lot of innovation. Um, and so, you know, that's kind of where we've been able to be successful here, where, you know, you can, we can use our expertise 
um, and our experience, and then you know provide you know uh, use some collaboration between companies to provide the right solutions in each situation. So taking a look at some of the trends uh, in the industry as well as the performance indicators, the first trend that we're seeing is global manufacturing throughout companies. Um, many companies have different facilities throughout different regions of the world, uh, and with that comes its own challenges. Next, we have concerns over the demand of demand versus the supply of batteries in the future. Uh, right now, our expected demand is very close, if not exceeding the supply for future uh, future batteries. Uh, and one of the factors that companies must address in order to meet this demand is utilizing effective and reliable quality control testing. Right. Um, Another trend uh, we are seeing is the large amount of personnel turnover within the industry. While this is not solely seen in the battery industry, uh, it's definitely a critical factor for testing challenges. Um, you know, for instance, when you have a skilled or experienced operator leave the company uh, and testing falls to those who are less experienced, it can become a bottleneck for um, quality control and for production. Uh, and then lastly here uh, for trends, we have, uh, we've been seeing constant innovation. Uh, within the battery industry. And I'm sure everybody here probably knows this as well. The, the industry is rapidly evolving. Uh, and with that brings new challenges within testing and other areas uh, that companies like Instron, like us, uh, are here to help and grow with you. So looking at the performance indicators here that kind of come from these trends, um, the three indicators we've seen in the industry that I'm going to kind of be touching back on throughout this are throughput, repeatability, and safety. Um, first, looking at throughput, things like high volumes of tests performed by many different operators. Some tests in, are even in like the hundreds of tests per shift. Um, you know, due to this, things like proper fixturing, um, things like ergonomics need to be considered. Um, you know, if you have an operator performing hundreds of tests per day, the ergonomics of the fixturing, the environment all matter a lot. When we look at repeatability, we look at things like pneumatic gripping, um, you know, ways to have constant repeatable pressure uh, or clamping force on each specimen, uh, ways to reduce operator variability, uh, you know, less operator dependence comes with pneumatic gripping, right? Uh, another factor is specimen alignment. Um, that can also be very critical for a lot of testing in this industry. Uh, and that's another thing that can be operator dependent can be really affected, heavily affected by operator, like uh, personnel turnover. And can, that can make things difficult to achieve if you had an experienced operator leave that was able to get repeatable results. And then lastly, we have safety. Uh, for safety, we want to ensure that there can be safe handling of the equipment and fixturing, as well as safe handling of materials and testing. So, you know, things like PPE, such as gloves and masks, uh, or even environmental and safety chambers for certain tests. Um, I'm not going to talk too much on environmental and safety chambers during this presentation, but, um, you know, Instron does work with companies for these, um, these situations as well. So if this is something that interests you as well, you know, that's something that we can kind of talk about separately too. Um, other things that we want to consider is like operator injuries, like finger pinches uh, when operating fixtures, especially at high volumes, you know, you might get into a repetitive motion and kind of you know, not be paying it as much attention after a while. Uh, and then, you know, we have a lot of delicate specimens with which require delicate equipment. Um, so making sure that we can handle the equipment safely uh, and avoid, you know, collisions or um, excessive loading. So for the key applications we're going to talk about today. Yeah. Uh, the key applications, the first one is uh, going to be separator film. Uh, so. Separator film would be, you know, we want to look at testing for material properties, given that they need to withstand things like lithium plating that can occur during extensive use, uh, as well as mechanical winding that occurs during assembly. Um, so they need to be able to withstand those. For metal foil, so this would be like the current collectors, the aluminum and copper foil. Uh, we want to make sure it can withstand things like the expansion and contraction during the use of each cell. Uh, so, for instance, you know, different material compounds within the electrode makeup can alter the needs for either higher or maybe lower elongation values or even tensile strength values. Um, so you need to be able to understand those values as well, those properties of your material. When it comes to electrode adhesion uh, to the current collectors, 
This is another important test. Um, they need to be able to withstand uh, the cracking or delaminating that occurs from current collectors, um, that occurs from the current collector during the constant charging or discharging of a cell, as well as the mechanical loading. Uh, and this right now is also you know, a common failure in cells today. And then when it comes to weld testing, um, you know, right now the majority of welds are ultrasonic or laser welded, but there are a ton of others in the industry as well. Um, but you know, for welds, you wanna make sure you can understand the failure mode or the necessary failure mode of each weld, right? The right way to test it. I think welds are a prime example of that emphasis that there's no one size fits all. Uh, each weld is, you know, each weld for each different cell between manufacturers, they can all be different. They can require different insights or different testing needs. Um, and you wanna focus on, you know, the right things for each weld. Um, the way I like to look at it is, you know, think of a car as a giant vibration chamber as it oscillates through the world. Um, a weld needs to be able to withstand that constant loading and vibration over the life of the cell. So when you're testing, you wanna make sure that you're testing um, the, the right way and getting the right properties of that weld or failures of the weld to ensure you know the life of each battery or weld. So for foil and separator film, taking a look at the um, primarily the tensile testing of these two. Uh, one of the key challenges that comes up is that high testing volume that I talked about. Um, this is uh, probably most prominent in foil and separator film testing. Um, for separator film, testing is performed in multiple cutting directions. Um, you know, we need to make sure you can ensure quality of the material in cross direction, machine direction, and sometimes even a diagonal direction of the material. Um, and then for both foil and separator film, you know, we've been seeing tests in the range of hundreds per shift for quality control. Um, so when you're considering high volumes like this, you want to be considering things like pneumatic gripping, uh, proper fixturing or proper aids um, are essential to ensure your proper throughput uh, and your repeatability is met. Um, and this is a key area for pneumatic gripping because it has less operator dependence and they don't have any time wasted with manual gripping for each specimen. Um, I, I can't imagine trying to manually clamp down, you know, three or 400 specimens in an eight hour shift. I think I would go insane. Um, another key challenge uh, is specimen alignment. So improper placement and alignment can lead to varying results, obviously hurting your repeatability. Um, if a specimen needs to be adjusted in the faces, both for separator or foil, sometimes it can actually lead to a premature break uh, in that, you know, when the reclamping occurs because that, that same area becomes weakened by the first initial clamp. Uh, so sometimes you end up wasting material if you don't have proper alignment, like the first time that you try to insert a specimen. Uh, products like, like shown to the right here, uh, this is Instron's Precision Specimen Loader. Um, it's an example of, uh, you know, something, uh, an aid that can be used uh, in these cases. It's highly recommended for both these materials, you know, with the delicate nature of them, having an alignment aid like this uh, or an insertion aid can help reduce the operator dependence and the variability uh, and also help increase the throughput. Um, this example to the right shows uh, the specimen loading device. It has a detachable fixture that holds your specimen and then a mating fixture that's attached directly to the grip. So it ensures both um, proper alignment and proper insertion of your specimen every single time. Um, again, coming back to like that, you know, the operator dependency variability that can occur, especially when you have two personnel turnover. Um, lastly, in the challenges here um, is for these materials, we have, you know, jaw face breaks. And this one's kind of a, a loaded challenge because there's a lot that goes on here. Um, but, you know, as innovation for thinner materials continue, uh, they become more delicate, more susceptible to premature jaw breaks without the proper equipment. Um, some material like separator film even leave a residue or like a powder behind. For any of you that have tested this, I'm sure you've seen it. Sometimes this powder can actually prevent proper clamping as well. Sometimes it can damage the material. Conse you know, consecutive tests can start to damage the material if not cleaned properly. So, for instance, utilizing things like rubber-coated jaw bases, and the alignment aid, again, shown to the right there, something like that, can help reduce premature jaw face breaks. Um, however, one other critical factor here that can lead to poor results uh, or premature breaks is the preparation of each specimen. Um, because the majority of these specimens are cut to like a uniform width, so that means, you know, 
Um, they're not a dog bone shape. They don't have a reduced section. Um, the edge quality of every specimen must also be considered when you're preparing them. Uh, with, the, with a perfect specimen and preparation, a jaw face break actually in this case generally can be accepted, uh, which is somewhat surprising to say and hear. Um, but this is because with good quality edges and material uniformity, the highest stress concentration of a uniform with specimen will be at the jaw faces. Um, so due to this, it's also important to understand the expected results and the material properties when performing tests on separator film and foil. Uh, again, this, this, this is a bit more that can be discussed as far as jaw face breaks, proper, proper jaw faces, stuff like that for these types of materials. Um, I don't really have enough time to get into all those details in this webinar, but if this is something that affects you or something you want to talk more about, both alignment aids or you know jaw faces and the breaks, um, I'm happy to take this offline, discuss separately if you guys want to reach out. So moving along to electroadhesion, um, first we're going to talk about 90 and 180 degree peel tests for electroadhesion. Um, one of the most common questions I receive is, which is better for testing, 90 or 180? Uh, the answer is generally, it depends, right? So I don't really have a clear cut answer to give people. Um, I, I see a big, um, a large amount of customers doing each. Um, but, you know, this kind of comes to the key challenges that might come from each and maybe the pros and cons that will come from each. Um, the first challenge between these two variations of peel testing are in regards to the need for a substrate. Uh, for those of you that don't know what a substrate is, it's like a rigid body material that you would adhere um, essentially your anode or cathode to um, because your anode or cathode is too delicate. Um, so in this case, we, we typically recommend like a mirror coated finished substrate, like a metal substrate that you would adhere like an anode to. Um, for 180 degree peel testing, it always requires a substrate. Um, you need that rigid material to attach your cathode or anode to in order to maintain a proper 180 degree peel throughout every test. If you don't use one, you'll see the material just kind of flops around as it goes. Uh, and we would never recommend that. That's not how you get repeatable results for your testing. Um, however, when you need to add that substrate, it not only adds to the preparation time between each test, uh, but it also adds to the cleanup time between each test. And if you've ever had to do this with a substrate, you know that usually peeling off an anode from that or cathode too can be pretty messy and um, undesirable at times. 90 degree peel testing, on the other hand, uh, is usually optimal for throughput because it doesn't need a substrate to maintain the proper angle if done correctly. Um, you know, some cathodes do require a substrate, substrate still with 90 degree peel testing. Sometimes they're just too... Um, they almost crack too easily. So you do need kind of that rigid body to attach them to. Um, but for the majority of testing, and especially for anodes, um, 90 degree peel testing, you can usually get away without a substrate by clamping it properly and having the right size specimen. Um, so that is a benefit of the 90 degree peel test. Um, however, that kind of brings us to the next thing of peel alignment. So while 90, 90 degree peel does not need a substrate for majority of the testing, uh, 180 degree peel testing uh, does have an advantage because it is uh, what we would consider is self-aligning. So as long as you set up the 180 degree peel test with a substrate and you set it up at the right angle like, properly, um, it'll pretty much self-align to 180 degrees as you begin your test. For 90 degree peel testing, on the other hand, though, most fixtures are designed to have a one-to-one -one ratio of sled movement to crosshead movement. And so if you set it up at, you know, say, you know, for instance, an 85 degree angle, it's going to maintain that 85 degree angle throughout the test. Um, you're not going to reach 90 degrees. And so that right alone can add variability in your results, especially if your operators aren't able to properly um, ensure alignment each time. Uh, the fixturing that was shown, that's shown to the right here, this is an example of uh, Instron's pneumatic 90 degree peel fixture. Uh, this is was designed in specific for electroadhesion testing. Um, so this fixture is an example of something that could be used. It incorporates pneumatic clamping of the specimen, so it makes it easy to grip to grip the specimen down uh, without a substrate. Um, and then it actually uses what we call a, a swing clamp alignment aid that ensures a 90 degree start at each test. So I'll play the video here and show. So this is inserting the specimen into the clamps. And then little flip switch and that brings in the swing clamp that helps you start your test in the same position every single time lets you go to 90 degree alignment and then you remove it and you can start your test I'll 
again, the pneumatic clamping is another thing, you know, repeatable clamping force, uh, ease of use, right? You don't need to manually clamp down on anything helps with your throughput. So if you're, if you're looking for highest throughput for this type of testing, uh, I highly recommend something like the pneumatic 90 degree peel testing. If you're lower throughput and you're okay with the cleanup, 180 degree peel is also okay. So another challenge, and this is also another very common question I get, uh, is what kind of tape to use? Um, this one's this one's also a different one, a difficult question to answer. Um, some tapes I've seen in the past uh, are very rigid, so they can make it really hard uh, for the test to keep a proper angle because of the tape, because the rigidity of the tape just won't conform to either 90 degrees or 180 degrees. Um, other tapes may not have good or repeatable adhesion to the specimen. That's another factor you need to look for. Um, unfortunately, it's been shown that each material is different. So there's no, again, no one size fits all for tape in this case. There's no like underlying, like this tape works every single time, unfortunately. Um, a couple I can recommend, um, 3M double coated paper tape, I've seen good, um, good results with, as well as Tessafix is different types of carpet tape. Um, one inch, two inch, depends on kind of what you're doing if you need a substrate. Um, but those are a couple examples. There's a lot out there, though. Um, but um, other variables to also consider, though, uh, aside from the tape, would be uh, the environment and the preparation of the material. So this material can definitely, it can be very affected by the temperature and humidity, as well as things like the settle time of the material or of the tape curing to the material. Um, so having a controlled environment and controlled process for this testing is also important. Um, a lot of this data from here is used as a correlation between good and bad um, adhesion. And so you want to make sure you have the most controlled setup as possible. So another type of electro adhesion testing that we've seen uh, is tack testing. As of lately, I'm yet to see tack testing take, take over as like a primary quality control test, but it has been seen as a secondary one. Um, so it, like, I mean, as, as far as primary goes, I'm talking usually a primary would be 90 or 180 degree peel test for quality control or understanding the properties of your electrode adhesion. Um, but tack test has definitely been coming in as a secondary one. One of the key challenges that come from this setup, so for anyone who's tried to set up a tack test before uh, using something like two different platens. It's pretty evident how time consuming and difficult it could be. Um, since it's critical to repeatability that the contact area of the tack be the same for every single test, an operator must ensure that they prepare the tack on each platen identically and align it properly every single time, which can be very difficult, especially if you have like circular platens and a square tack uh, or anything like that, or any misalignment in the load string, things like that can be very critical here. Um, this is another prime example of where you know, proper fixturing can help reduce this variability, help reduce the operator dependency, and increase your throughput. Uh, the fixturing to the right here is an example of uh, a tack fixture that Instron's designed. Um, it's designed to test five specimens consecutively, all from one single larger specimen. Um, the fixturing ensures proper contact area and alignment of every single test. Play a quick video for you guys here. So this is just showing it's moving over to the next specimen. Um, so that would be, I believe this one was specimen five, come down and this is an abbreviated, it's a quick inversion of the test just to show for, for an example here. So another challenge that comes from tag testing though, is, uh, is the data rate. So data rate's not always considered when running tests like this, or even in general, a lot of, a lot of tests, um, a lot of battery tests, especially, you know, talking about separator film and foil and 90, 180 degree peel testing, data rate isn't super critical. You don't need a very high data rate. But when we talk about a tack test, um, the force is generally occurring in, you know, I'd say less than a second, usually even less than like a quarter of a second, you see like the peak of the force come in. Um, and if your data rate's too low, it can lead to variability in that true peak that gets captured. Um, so when you have a fast enough data rate, you'll see a more repeatable and accurate peaks for every single test. Um, a typically recommended data rate here, uh, we say is about 2000 Hertz. Um, it can be achieved with a high performance controller on a materials testing machine. 
I highly recommend that. Um, something lower than that does increase your chances of not capturing the true peak. And then lastly here with tack testing, uh, one of the challenges is the uneven delamination. Um, it's something that I've seen before in tax that can be a wide, lead to a widespread of variability in your results. Uh, this occurs when the platens are not properly parallel to one another. It can change every time the fixturing is either like replaced or after each test, um, if the proper fixturing isn't used. So the tack fixturing, again, the one to the right here, it utilizes what we call a spherical seat. So this is an example of one way to ensure proper parallelism between each test where you lock the spherical seat um, and it will maintain that parallelism throughout the test. All right, so moving on to weld testing. Um, so this is the last application that we'll kind of talk about here. Uh, a key challenge for weld testing uh, is, I think I mentioned this a little before, is that replicating the proper failure modes. So for batteries, uh, it's very important to understand the way a weld will be used in production, as well as its mechanical loading during you know, the use of the battery or the assembly. Um, testing for the right failure mode is critical so you can understand the life of each weld. So with that comes challenges like specimen alignment and offset as well. Um, some welds need to maintain a true 90 degree angle throughout the entire test, whereas maybe other welds just need an offset or they don't need to maintain any angle. It's more of just a grip it and rip it type of weld. Um, but you need to ensure that you know the failure mode that needs to occur, right? You need to ensure you understand how, you know, maintaining 90 degrees versus just pulling and ripping it will affect the results or um, will show you what that will give you. Um, so ensuring proper alignment uh, is also something that's very critical here. Um, ensure you're setting up and running each test comparably for the most repeatable results. So you wanna make sure you have alignment from one specimen to another, one operator to another, again, coming back to that. Um, an example of fixturing the instruments worked on for, uh, for example, this is a, it would be like a prismatic cell. Um, and this is for the, uh, the current collector on a prismatic cell. Uh, it's shown in the bottom right here, I'll play the video in a second. This fixture has an alignment aid that comes into place and helps with the insertion of the specimen and then can move out of the way um, for when you begin your test, as well as has a lower hook um, that's able to ensure proper alignment and the proper failure mode of this test. So you see moving the alignment aid out of the way, and I'll kind of show you a close up of the uh, lower hook there. Other, other things we have here, uh, the picture in the, the top left picture shows an example of a cylindrical cell. Uh, this one was measuring a tab to cap welding. Um, this one used, utilized actually custom jaw faces, like what we call consider shoulder jaw faces um, that were able to hold the cap uh, at an offset so that you were um, breaking the weld uh, along the axial or the center of the load string. Uh, we did find that some tests like this were very critical to having a proper alignment in the center of a load string versus testing at an offset, um, that the offset proved to have much less repeatable results. And then another challenge here uh, we've seen is specimen preparation. So uh, there's a fine line between minimizing specimen preparation and maximizing repeatability. Uh, ideally, any company wants the minimal amount of time to prepare each specimen, right? You wanna save as much time as possible. However, sometimes this can compromise that repeatability if specimens cannot be prepared and tested properly. Um, so we recommend working with, with you know, an application expert, someone that can help address this and sometimes like even perform proof of concept testing to ensure things are correct. Um, that's something that we've done a lot in the past. Um, and it's definitely how we've determined you know, how something needs to be tested or how much preparation might need to go into it and how that can affect your results that you're looking for. So when it comes to data collecting and correlating, um, as we've been seeing gigafactories being announced all over the world, you know, many companies having multiple locations in various countries, uh, it's important to emphasize the repeatability and consistency and results from lab to lab. Uh, data inconsistencies can be a huge challenge, challenge for companies uh, when they have multiple locations, especially, you know, you have locations in different time zones and different countries uh, and completely different operators and different cultures and everything. Um, one of the more obvious impacts to repeatability 
is consistency with fixturing and equipment. Um, you know, replicating the fixturing and test parameters is essential from lab to lab, no matter where the location is. Um, if you have, you know, side pneumatic side action grips at one lab, you want to have those same pneumatic side action grips at the other lab. Um, having different grip fixturing can definitely produce different results. Um, uh, but while fixturing and testing aids are also are important, um, other things operators can use um, for repeatability is things like software that can help monitor and analyze the consistency as well as the acceptance of the results, right? Control the acceptance and um, control what's being able, what's able to be used by operators as well, uh, making sure every operator is using the same test method um, and testing correctly. Um, so being able to compare results between different frames, different labs, different sites, um, that can reduce the level of discrepancies as well as avoid bad batches of material. Um, so we recommend things like having a result tracking uh, and even analysis software. So something that's like capable of querying all results from testing locations together can provide uh, you know consistent and safe products each time, right? Um, so an example of how Instron achieves this, we use things like our uh, trend tracker or Blue Hill Central modules that do help with the traceability of results, traceability of you know what methods can be used, um, and making sure that operators are you know testing with the correct method and uh, and being able to analyze the data correctly. Um, lastly, when we're considering data collection and inconsistencies, uh, it's also important important to have proper support. And I think this maybe goes without saying, but I think it's it's it is important here. So both technical and application support. Um, you know, when you have locations in different areas of the world, getting consistent and dependable support is also a critical factor. You can't be getting support in one area of the world and not in the other. And I think that's a, a big value that I've seen Instron be able to bring to this industry as well. Um, so people like myself, you know, we work on applications teams. We can provide you know, significant value to customers that need a little higher level of support in these cases and a little bit more hands-on. So in summary here, you know, we've covered a few of the main tests that are seen. Uh, I know there are many more in the industry, as I've already said. Um, we just don't have time to cover all that in one webinar. Um, you know, the key takeaways for us here when looking at the current pain points in the industry includes things like, um, like pneumatic and application-specific fixturing, right? So you want to be looking for fixturing that can provide repeatable clamping, uh, minimal, minimal operator involvement, minimal operator dependency. Uh, as well as look for things that can help with, you know, alignment aids um, and minimize your specimen preparation needed, right? So again, dedicated fixturing for these things can be very beneficial. Um, when it comes to safety, look for safety features, uh, considerations and fixtures and frames, things that can protect operators, materials, equipment. Um, and then, you know, you know nece the necessary global service you want to work with a testing machine company that can provide global service and support. You want to make sure you have the, that you have the ability to ask for support, share knowledge surrounding each application. Uh, additionally, you know, you want quick service. You want to be able to help prevent unnecessary downtime, you know, especially in a quality control environment. Uh, and then lastly, again, just coming back to this, like there's no one size fits all. Um, there's always something new, uh, but people like me at Instron, we're here to help as, as many others are as well here. Um, and we're, you know, we've been partnering with companies um, for a while now. And from that partnership, we can provide knowledge and expert experience uh, can be a huge benefit to some. And, you know, we're here to help avoid some of the challenges that may come up. So thanks everyone for attending. Uh, I think at this time we can kind of go to some of the questions and see what Phil has had from there. Nick. All right. I am back on uh, and looking at the questions we do have a few so charlie i'll i'll toss this first one over to you um have any astm or iso standards been developed to address testing these types of materials i'm assuming that we covered today um so there have been uh there have been some some astm or iso standards that have been what i would consider adopted for these types of testing, uh, but I wouldn't. Oh, let me turn my sorry. Let me turn my video back on. Um, so there's been there's been a good amount of ASTM or ISO standards that have been adopted 
for these types of testing that might have like similar uh, materials that were tested before. Uh, but up until now, there really isn't anything that's been directly um, related to you know, battery materials, right? So there's no ASTM standard for separator film yet. Um, and I think uh, you know, this is likely in the works for some different applications, but up until now, there's just a lot of ones. If you were dealing with specific application and you want some guidance on maybe some standards um, that could help out, um, you can reach out to us can help out with that. Or I think on our website too, some of the, some of the main applications, like the ones I went over today, we do give some examples of ASTM and ISO app, um, standards that are similar. All right. And it looks like we, we do have uh, a related question uh, that kind of came in. Looks like what, what about standards for the battery components testing, i.e. ASTM, BS, EN? If you can uh, kind of elaborate on, on that. Can you say that one more time, Nick? Uh, what about standards for the battery components testing uh, related to ASTM, BS, or, or EN? Um, I would need to know a little more about different components. I think it's probably pretty similar, Phil. I don't know if you have specific... Yeah. Uh, specifically at the cell level, there's standards like UN 38.3 that have been pretty common and coming up on a regular basis. And those standards and the uh, ECR100, which is kind of a, a the EV equivalent of that, if you will, uh, kind of define a number of sections where you have shot testing, thermal testing, crush testing, abuse testing, um, that that are that are, are are adopted especially for shipment of battery cells and modules and packs, uh, and that's what they address primarily. But those are the most common standards that we see in the mechanical testing world, anyway, for at this cell and battery and pack uh, level. All right, we'll jump over to another question. Uh, what are some things we should think about in terms of our tensile testing setups? Uh, I, I can take this one, Phil. Uh, I would say, so things like the load cell capacity, the accuracy of the load cell, um, your alignment, so kind of like what I talked about before, uh, specimen alignment, grip alignment, those are very critical. Um, pneumatic fixturing, also very beneficial here, right? So removing the operator variability. Um, then there are other things like, um, like, like test method parameters that you need to consider. Um, so things like uh, preload, test speeds, um, all those you want to make sure you have consistent test parameters uh, between methods, stuff like that can definitely help with the consistency and the repeatability of your results. All right, uh, jumping over to another question. Uh, what other measurements can be taking, taken using an Instron frame? Okay, I, I can try to answer that one. So, I mean, Instron has a number of standard accessories that exist for strain measurement, for example, so a number of extensometers, both contact and non-contact that you can use in parallel with your load cells and your the displacement sensors that are integrated to the frames. So, obviously, those signals are all brought into the software and the controller. But we also have signal conditioner module cards that are basically data acquisition cards that you can use to acquire signals from any kind of third party equipment that has an analog or a digital output to it. And the benefits of that are that you get, you know, really good data correlation, synchronized data, along with your load and displacement, you get all these third party instrument readings that are brought into your software where you can then uh, as part of your report and data analysis, uh, run really close correlation between some of the electrical or thermal events that you're recording along with the load and the displacement and, and sort of strain value. Uh, and then from a data management perspective, it obviously it simplifies that a lot because everything is centralized in your blue hole software uh, and stored in the same locations with the same timestamp. Um, so really, uh, any any kind of analog or digital signal can be acquired, and if you have those instruments and want to take it to one step further where you're actually controlling them as part of your software method, 
then we do have a custom engineering group that that will take on custom software uh, uh, projects like that to help you integrate you know your full command set from your instruments such that you can vary your condition uh, voltage current that type of, uh, of stuff for temperature during your your experiment as well all right thanks for that uh, I think we'll probably do maybe two more questions here um, so I know Charlie you you touched on some of this aspect uh, in a few different slides but um, throughput is a big focus for us are there any tips or best practices you could cover that can help improve efficiency for testing um yeah I think I mean I touched on good amount uh is this was this do they say if this was like for tensile testing or for certain um I mean there's a couple of questions in here kind of tied to I think some of the slides that you covered and then there's also like right. aspects of automation yeah um so okay I, I think it, it depends on the exact test that you'd be looking at if you're talking about simple tests like tensile testing, I highly recommend things like automation. I think that's a great opportunity there. Um, remove pretty much all operator dependency. Um, if you're doing more unique testing, um, you know, things like a, a attack test or a peel test, you might need, you might still need somewhat of an operator, but things like having dedicated fixturing to that. I think Ian, or sorry, Ian, Phil just talked about our, uh, our ESG group, our custom engineering group. They do quite a bit, um, for both software and the fixturing side of things, they can make, you know, they've made a lot of our, our custom dedicated fixturing to EV battery testing. Um, we also have things like uh, we have an XY stage, uh, like an automated XY stage. So if you don't want to go full automation system, automated XY stage can be great because um, I can provide some additional throughput depending on what you're testing um, without having to have like a, a full uh, system. Okay. Um, let's see here. So I think the, the last question we'll, uh, we'll jump into here and then any other ones that kind of come in, we can, um, address those afterwards with those individuals. Um, so what are the differences between the manual and pneumatic 90 degree peel fixtures? Uh, so a manual 90 degree peel fixture, um, well, has no pneumatics, right? So when you're clamping a specimen, um, you would need to have, you had a manual side clamps on each side that you kind of bring into place and, and clamp over excess specimen, right? So for instance, you'd have like a two inch wide specimen uh, with maybe a one inch wide peel. You'd have, you know, half an inch or so on each end to kind of grip the specimen uh, with the, the, the manual clamps. The pneumatic peel fixture was designed specifically for this type of testing. So it has the clamps already in place, kind of just hit a foot switch and it just closes down on it. Uh, and then the other big, uh, big difference is that alignment aid that I kind of showed in that video. Um, having that swing clamp, I, I found is very critical for repeatability and testing. Uh, it takes out a lot of operator dependency and make sure that you do have a 90 degree peel every single time. It's well, thank you. Bill. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, we'll wrap things up here. I do have a couple quick notes before we go. Um, again, any questions that continue to come in, we'll be sure to follow up with those individuals by email. And just a reminder that we did record this session. So I'll be emailing each of you a copy of today's uh, recording along with the slide deck. And you're also going to see a survey once we close the webinar. We'd really appreciate your feedback on today's presentation. And then the last thing I want to mention is you can always find the latest upcoming and on-demand webinars on our website. I'm actually going to drop a link into the chat now where you can find that on our website. Uh, so with that said, I just want to say thanks again to Charlie for presenting and thanks, Phil, for hopping on for some questions here. And thanks to all of you for attending. Really appreciate you joining us. And we hope to see you again at our, at our next one. Uh, have a great day, everybody.